Fixed on Jesus. Fixed on Jesus. What are you fixed on so far this year? Uh, are you doing Veganuary? <laughs> no, you're not, Stefan. You're not doing Veganuary. Did you try? So, yeah, so when, when they lived with you, it, the, the powers of persuasion were not, not quite adequate uh, to convert the pagan uh, over there. No? Lisa's on the way. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, you know, generally where the wife goes, the man follows. I mean, this is usually what, what happens in life. Eventually. Eventually. After 35 years of marriage, Penny's still waiting, but we're getting there, you know. We're making a bit of progress here and there. Uh, I don't know what your, your new thing is for the new year, but um, it's exciting to have a fresh start. Uh, I appreciate uh, Stefan preaching two weeks ago, Asagi last week, which is just terrific. Um, we're going to continue with the same idea of really setting ourselves up for the year ahead. Um, and we're going to talk about being fixed on Jesus for the year ahead. If, not, if there's nothing else we can fix ourselves on, I mean, if there's nothing else we do, but find a way to fix ourselves more on Jesus for the year ahead, I think we'd have an exciting uh, year and prospect. So that's what I wanted to focus on, this passage in Hebrews 12. Let's turn there. Get the Bible with you. Let's go to Hebrews 12 and talk about this. And then we have some uh, group work, some discussion to do as part of the sermon. And you'll notice if you saw the PDF handout I sent around yesterday, this one's different because I changed it this morning because some, I had some new ideas. So that's why it's looking a little bit different. So Hebrews chapter 12, let's think here about what it's telling us about Jesus in, in verse 1 here. Therefore, and the therefore, well, we'll talk about the therefore, why it's therefore in a minute, but the therefore, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith for the joy set before him, he endured even the cross scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Is it next week is supposed to be the most depressed day of the year? The 20 something, 20, is it? Yeah, when the, when the credit card bill comes in for Christmas along with the, the cold weather and, and no, no. Well, I don't know if that's actually literally true or one of those urban myths, but nonetheless, what, ha what can happen when you've had a fresh start, whether it's the beginning of a year or something else that happens, it can happen that after a little while, we get a bit weary. And the Bible writer knows this. He knows that in the Christian life, even though we have the spirit, even though we have the good news, even though we have all of what we have here, Still sometimes, even a Christian can grow weary and even a Christian can lose heart. And this is giving us a bit of uh, inoculation against that. I suppose it's the equivalent of the flu jab for the winter or something. Steroids. Steroids, even. <laughs> okay. So we're getting some kind of inoculation here, some immunization uh, and some insulation to help us for when we find ourselves getting weary and losing heart. We've got a way to deal with it. And that's what we're going to be talking about um, here today. Now, the therefore, before we talk about this bit, the, the therefore is important, the beginning of the verse 1 there, therefore. And the therefore is chapter 11. Now, don't look back there, because I know you, a lot of you know this stuff. So in chapter 11, what's happening? A lot of stuff about faith. What are we being given in chapter 11? What do you remember from chapter 11? <coughs> e examples. Who's, who's mentioned in chapter 11? Just from memory. Abraham. Abraham Noah. Noah Moses. Ahab. 
Rahab, Rahab, yes, Rahab, not Ahab. <laughs> that R in front's important. Okay, Rahab, Gideon, so many, right? So, so many. We got this long list of people who are named, and then it just says, and loads of others, <laughs> right? Um, who lived out their faith in extraordinary circumstances. They're, they're mentioned because they lived in a, what in the world sense would be a bizarre way, because they lived by faith. So since you got all these examples, well, then you got all of that, well then let's us live a life like they did by faith. And the way we do that is by fixing our eyes more on Jesus. And what he had done, because he talks here about the cross, and thank you, uh, Liesl, for what you shared about Jesus on the cross. Um, it is that that gives us hope for ourselves, because we know it doesn't all depend on us. It's, it's so much about Jesus. So what I'd like to do is, is talk about the past a little bit, then we'll talk about the present and uh, the lessons we can learn from that. And before we get to our first discussion question about how the memories of past spiritual victories help us stay fixed on Jesus, our own spiritual victories. All of us here who are a Christian have had some spiritual victories. And you may say, well, I can't, I don't think I have. Well, you must have or you wouldn't still be here. So you have had some spiritual victories, whether you consider them to be large or small, impressive or otherwise, or whether they were in a long, dim, distant past, you have had them. So we're going to be discussing those in, in groups in a moment. But I wanted to share you about one that came back to my mind recently. I was so encouraged uh, to have this brought back to my mind. And it's connected with our caroling evening uh, in December when Mark Timlin turned up with his father, uh, uh, with, with Barry. And it was lovely uh, to see them and reminded me so much of the times when Penny and I lived in Preston Road and got to know Mark and Brendan, his brother, the brother of Brendan, and uh, their sister, Veronica. So those are the photographs on your handout, um, is Tim, various bits of the Tim Lin family. So what we have here is, up here is, is Brendan Jr., who is Mark Tim Lin's twin brother. So these are the twin brothers and their children. And then we have here, not very good picture on here, but you've got it on your handout, uh, Veronica Timlin, their sister, her husband, um, uh, Jonathan McAleish, who some of us would remember from back in the day in the Northwest, uh, where we all were at one time, and that's their children. And top right, who, who's that? Anybody know apart from Penny? Charlie and Jeanette. Charlie Jeanette Hines. All right. And the reason they're in the picture is this. Somewhere towards the end of 1990, a chap called James Gordine. Anybody know James Gordine? You were around. You'd remember James Gordine. He was tube preaching. He was on the tube preaching. And he'd preach a short message between stops and then hand out invitation cards to a Bible discussion. Charlie and Jeanette were on one of those tubes. And they took a card. They'd recently arrived over from Ireland. They were looking for a church. And so they took a card and they went to a Bible discussion. It might have been in the north of London, but they were living in the northwest, actually quite close to us. And so they came to our Bible discussion um, in, I think, uh, either late 1990 or early 1991. They, um, they came along and they became Christians on the uh, 22nd of February. I, can, I know that because I have here my diary from 1991. Uh, I've kept this. And in, in this diary, I have the baptism dates for all the people who were baptized that year. And uh, there they are in February, February the 22nd and uh, along with a number of other people. So they were baptized in February, and then around the corner from us, there was another Bible discussion, um, and the leaders of that Bible discussion went on a mission team to Milan, and we had no one to lead it. And Charlie and Jeanette, we said, would you lead it? And they were, this was in May, so they were, March, April, three-month-old Christians. Uh, we said, would you lead it? They said, okay, by faith, because what did they know what they were doing? Maybe it was actually quite good they didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> but anyway, they, they said, okay. So in May, they started leading that Bible discussion. And then I forget which one of the Timlins was the first to come along. You know, do you remember? I don't, it's, it wasn't Mark. It was either Veronica or Brendan. Anyway, one of the Timlins came to that Bible discussion and started studying the Bible and brought their other two siblings and all three of them studied the Bible, and all three of them were baptized in July. I have that in here as well. There they are. Uh, 
Mark Timlin, Brendan Timlin, and uh, Veronica Timlin, all three of them. And the story continues because the picture there that I haven't mentioned in the middle is their mother, Marie. And at the time, she was in the end stages of terminal cancer. And she was, she'd gone back to the Czech Republic because she was Czech. So the Timlin's father is Irish and mother is Czech. So she'd gone back to the Czech Republic to stay with her mother in a cottage in the mountains. where They'd actually built a cottage that was in the mountains in Czechoslovakia. Now, this is 1991. There was no mobile phones. In fact, there were no landlines to the cottage. Having become Christians, Brendan and Mark and Veronica all wanted to reach out to their mother who was dying. So they basically took it in turns to fly over to the Czech Republic for a week at a time or so, go to this remote place in the, in the hills and study the Bible with their mother, bearing in mind that they were literally just out of the water of baptism and didn't know what they were doing. So they took God to gospel studies with them that I gave them and they went up and did this sort of relay Bible studies with their mother and they would cut, there was no phone there, so they came down the mountain to the post office, where it was the only place in the village that had a telephone. And then they would ring me and make it ring, and then I would ring them back, because it was very expensive, of course. So I would ring them, and then they'd tell me about how the Bible study went, and I'd give them some input, and the next few verses and some ideas, they'd go off, and, and the next day or two, they'd come back, and they did this for a little while, Mark, Brendan, and Veronica, and then uh, Marie was baptized in September. There's her name, Marie Timlin, was baptized. And she went home to be with the Lord about two weeks, maybe, or so after that. And I share the story. I mean, it, just thinking and reminding myself about it was very, very encouraging, obviously. But it made me think about how it's simple things that enable God to do big things. James Gordine preaching on a tube is not a logical thing. It's, it's not a smart thing. It's, it's not... And I'm no way in suggesting that we should do particular actions, like I've just talked about that story. That's not my point. I guess James was just exercising his faith. You think about Charlie and Jeanette as three-month-old Christians starting to lead a family group, a Bible discussion, which they did not know how to. That doesn't make any sense. It was a step of faith. And then the Timlins... Uh, relay Bible studies with their mother, it, it, it was difficult for them. What did they know how to do? And it was a step of faith. And I love that step of faith. It, to me, it's a kind of an illustration of what it means to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Because when your eyes are fixed on Jesus, you often don't do things that are logical or make sense. You step out in faith and you're willing, we're willing to do that when, when that happens. And I just think it's so important that we don't forget the way that God moves through nonsensical things, through small things, through simple acts of faith. So this helped me to, um, to, to, to begin to wonder what God could do today uh, in my life or anybody else's life. So can we just spend a few moments thinking about this uh, question? How can these past spiritual victories help you stay fixed on Jesus. So what I want to do is let's break up into small groups of three or four or something and talk about an example of a past spiritual victory. And not boasting, because it's God that does this, right? But just something that's encouraged you in the past that you think, that could help me because it can remind me of what I can do with Christ. How are we doing? Come up with some ideas, some memories. I think what I'm going to do today I'm not going to ask us to share those now, although I'm sure it'd be nice to hear, but more the point within our groups, I think, as we've got some other things to talk about as well. I, I, would, I would say, I mean, I was prompted by seeing Mark. It might take a little bit of effort to think through uh, some victories you've had, but that's okay. You might want to look back at photographs. Photographs can be a good a reminder. You look back at a friend or you see a, a place and you think, oh, yeah, I remember that happened there. Photographs can be useful. Um, so one of the ways to be encouraged about having hope for the future and keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus is to remember what he has done in the past. And you may also remember that a lot of what he has done or what he did at that time, your life was not perfect at the time. Far from it. And I think back to that time when we lived in Preston Road 
Um, I would not repeat the way I was living at that time again. It, it was madness. Um, utter, and that's another story for another time, but it was utter madness. And I wouldn't recommend anybody live the way, in some of the ways that we were living then and, and so on. But God worked, worked things out, worked some good out of it. And it's important not to throw away baby and bath water. And if you're in the middle of a tough season right now, it's important not to assume, oh, I'll be useful to God again once things have calmed down. It is more likely, in my opinion, that you may be less useful to God when things have calmed down, given that when we look at the heroes of the faith in Hebrews 11 and even the life of Jesus himself, things seem to be most, the Spirit seemed to be moving most powerfully at the times when the individuals concerned were least in control of what was going on in their lives. So it's about living by faith. I think that's a lot of what we see here. I also wanted to mention, and I forgot uh, earlier, just to say that with these, the Timlins, um, some of you will know this, but uh, Brendan went on to help plant the church in the Czech Republic on the mission team there. Mark went to start the work in Afghanistan, the Hope Works we still have uh, there, which because uh, Barry and others are very connected with, and Leon's visited. Um, and, um, and Jonathan and Veronica either went on the mission team to plant the church in Belfast or were there in the very early days and are still there. So it, the, the work continues to spread. And the stuff that you and I have done, the, the fruits of which we're unaware of, we'll only know in the next life, which is an inspiring uh, thought. Anyway, moving on to obstacles. Let's talk about obstacles a little bit. Uh, we've got to throw off the stuff that hinders, right? He says here, throw off the things that hinder, the sin that so easily entangles. I just love these. I found these online. These are cycle lane obstacles, right? Can you, who, whoever designed these? This one going through a barrier. This one with a telegraph pole. Back. I have to get a little bit of a swerve around the side there. Uh, this, this is an interesting one. Trying to go th through that bench. I don't know how that's, that's going to work. Another pole there. A nice tree there. And uh, this one right across a, ca a dual carriageway or some kind with a barrier in the middle. I, I don't, well, obviously, with Photoshop, one can do many things. Uh, but you've seen some, and I have too. I have been on cycle lanes which are not cycle lanes. Let's put it that way. No. Um, we've, we've all got things in our way. We've all got things that get in, in between us and having our eyes fixed on Jesus. So I was going to suggest we have some group discussion, but because of just time and things, I think what I'd like to ask us to do is to make a commitment to ourselves and to the Lord right now to say, I'm going to go and pray about God revealing to me what obstacles there might be in my life. Obstacles aren't the same as sins here, right? Because he talks about some things that entangle, that hinder, and other things, sorry, yeah, some things that hinder and the sin that so easily entangles. So sometimes what gets in between us and fixing our eyes on Jesus is sin. Sometimes it's just stuff in our lives that doesn't need to be there and is unhelpful. I think it's a good thing to think every now and again about other some things just to cut out, to, to, to change. And it may be simple. Um, for me, I, I produce quite a lot of podcasts and video things. Some of them are training materials. Some are just reflections. I decided to halve the number I'm doing this year, pretty much halve it, just to give me a bit more space in my life. I, I, because it, it's a good thing, but it's entangling me too much, like taking my eyes off Jesus. It's not a deliberate problem. It's just a recognition of something there that, no, let me halve that. And I can spend more time reading the Bible and studying and thinking and whatever I need to do. Perhaps you have something in your life like that. Something that's just not bad, but just in the way. So can I ask us all just to be sure that we do take time to step back, pray, think about sin that's in the way or something that's just an obstacle. Amen? Okay, that's the second thing. And then um, fixing our eyes on Jesus, what I would like to do is... is uh, in, in, in th sorry, this bit here, yeah. So can we do this as a discussion for a bit? What practical steps can you take to help you stay fixed on Jesus? I'll share one thing and then we'll have our group. So one of my resolutions this year is to pray through the Beatitudes every day. Um, I'm teaching on the Beatitudes and I'm preparing the teaching day on the Beatitudes for, the, for us as a church. Um, 
So I've been studying them a lot, but also I realize it's one thing to study them, it's another to get them in your heart. So I've decided to pray. And I have been, every, about the last four weeks now, I've been praying through the Beatitudes every day. And it's really helping me to think about Jesus because all of them are in the character and the heart of Jesus. Uh, he is uh, poor in spirit. He became poor for our sakes. He, is, uh, he doesn't mourn for us. He is meek. He was hungry and thirsty for righteousness, for sure. He was merciful and pure and a peacemaker, and he did endure persecution with peace and rejoiced over it. And so the more I'm praying about that, it's helping me to think more about the heart of Jesus. So discussion question for a few more minutes. What might help you to have your eyes more fixed on Jesus? What? There's that question. What can we do? What might be something, even just one small thing, that can help us to, th to thread it into our lives, what it means to have our eyes fixed on Jesus? Can we have a little bit of sharing? Just uh, give us a quick, a few quick ideas. It might spark some other ideas for us all. So a few quick ideas of what helps us stay fixed on Jesus, what, or what could. Can we get a few? Dan? Um, I've not shared this with the group yet. It's all right. One thing that really helps me in terms of being fixed on Jesus, um, I still feel like I'm playing it off for quite a time to pray, but I can still feel like I'm going through the motions of things. Right. One thing that really helps me to fix my on Jesus is preparing communion. Preparing communion? In terms of if I'm going to speak uh, and mm. share about communion, it's then where I really think about me and where I'm at and really focus on Jesus. Mm. So what I was going to say as a practical step was I was looking at what we do, not just one communion, but a stint of three, four, five weeks of sharing the communion on a consistent basis. Because mm. I don't, I don't, because I'm someone who don't tend to speak a lot in church. Yeah. But actually, when I do prepare communion, um, I take it very seriously, if that makes sense, because I feel like it's just really important to share the message. Mm. And, and it's also, for me, a good thing to really think about where I'm at and connect with Jesus more than a quiet time for some reason. Maybe I need to think about how to do a quiet time, but I don't know. It just I know what I'm like, but I know if I'm doing something, or I have to share something, it focuses me. Yeah, it's a way of focusing. Yeah. Super. Thank you. I like that. We'll, we'll, we'll figure that out. Yeah, why not? Why not? We all do a theme. Yeah, we can yeah, we'll work it out. Why not? Good stuff. A um, couple more. Uh, Simon? I was mentioning about you know, spending time with people. Very nice of Leon to come over last week. Yeah. Being with other people in a sort of sp spiritual context of a friendship that can help us to stay fixed on Jesus. Yeah, I think we can, you know, like lose focus and you know, think about all the yeah. and stuff, you know, but with, yeah. with another Christian, you know, kind of um, think more about Yeah, and we can all get isolated to some degree, yeah. right? Very good, yeah, thank you. Uh, Leon? I'm going to expand on something I'm going to talk with the group a little bit. I, I noticed the other day when I was walking to work and I didn't have my headphones in, but I was able to be a lot more engage with God uh, yeah. and I think this kind of reflecting on it now actually mate, I think it's so easy at the moment to feed yourself with the things you like and be entertained with the things you want there's no mm. real need to kind of engage with anything outside of that you know, our, our, our culture and our entertainment and our technology allow us to be very self-feeding mm. and it's quite nice to kind of get out of that loop and you actually and it, and it's, it's, it's almost like, you know, it was like walking, and sure, I was still surrounded by the city, still surrounded by man's creation, but it was a bigger thing. It, it was just engaging. It was much easier to sort of see God in the context of that rather than just in my own bubble. So, uh, yeah, breaking out of the bubble. Yeah. yeah, finding ways to not be stuck in the bubble. And the bubble, so it, it gives you so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's comfortable. Okay. I like that. That's a good thought. I'll tell you what, we better press on. I dare say we've got some good ideas. It might be interesting to share them. 
you know, what helps you might be different from what helps me, but, it, but sharing our ideas about what helps us uh, may help each other to think about other, other things uh, that can be helpful. So let's make sure we do share about that. I um, just want to wrap up by explaining this picture. I was walking through the park the other day in Casterbury. This is Casterbury. It was uh, as, about as cold as today. It was a day like today, nice blue sunny sky and all that. But it was uh, in the morning and it was jolly cold. And these people were out there. They're playing croquet. Yeah, that's so you. Yeah, they're playing croquet. Now, how many of you have played croquet? Yeah, actually, you know what I'm talking about. I love croquet. It's a lot of fun. My, my parents bought a croquet set in the 70s, and uh, we, we play it now and again. That's one of the things Penny had to learn to join to be part of our family, is, uh, <laughs> is to, uh, to play croquet. Um, but I, I, I was cold, and I was out there. I was on a prayer walk, so I was kind of like, I had a reason in my mind. I got a me reason to be out there in the cold, right? They had their woolly hats on, they got gloves on, they got really got layers and layers, and they, they looked like most of them were quite a bit older than me. And they were out there and they were having a whale of a time. I could hear them laughing, joking, chatting. They're having a great time. And it just struck me, they, they take joy in that croquet. They don't care if it's freezing. They take joy in it. What you take joy in, you find yourself involving yourself in. It says, for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. He not only knew and had clear in his mind his vision was to go to the cross, he had clear in his mind that he had the vision of this is joyful. This is for joy. There is joy at the end of this. The joy was just as clear to him as the cross. It seems to me that in my life, I am most wholehearted in my discipleship to Jesus when the clear to me is the cost. And maybe we need to think about that. For us to stay enthusiastic, as he says here, is to not grow weary and lose heart. We must find a way to keep perspective on the joy, the joy of now and the joy of forever. There is a joy in the now and there's a joy in the forever. And so maybe that's something for us also to think about. And I I don't know if I put this on the handout, but I think it would be very helpful to take some devotional time to prayerfully contemplate the future joys that can help you persevere in the present. What are the future joys that can help you persevere in the present? That'd be a useful thing, I think, to, uh, to pray about. And one last thing as I finish off. Uh, oh, well, I love this verse. This just sums it all up for me. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. And I think this is a lot of what it means to live a life that we're talking about here. <coughs> just to finish off. So you've got your, these flyers on the seats, right? Now, I was told by Kate that now and again I need to challenge us a bit more as a congregation. So uh, <laughs> you know, that's what she told me. That's what she told me. So I, I listen to what people tell me. Um, so no, I... So just, no, just, I just want to give us a spur, a gentle challenge. I want to give us a gentle challenge. I was asked to put this on and prepare this, which I am doing, and I'm thrilled about it, this teaching day thing. But I think it would be, it'd be such a shame if we, put, we all put an effort into this if we don't make the most of it. Mm. And so can I say that we're now uh, only just over a month away. In fact, it is next week a month, right? So it's four or five weeks. It's quite close. And we've got lots of these we've printed off. Can I ask us to do uh, three things? Number one is find a way to advertise it more broadly yourself through whatever means you have of social media or sticking it in a local shop window, one of these or something. I don't know. But you just think about how can, I, how can I spread the knowledge of this as widely as I can, not only in where you live, perhaps, but even more broadly, because people will travel. I mean, I know some people have told me they're coming from other parts of London to come, so, and Thames Valley, I think. So figure out, figure, figuring that out, number one. Number two, um, praying about who we can bring personally. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I've decided that I'm going to put an Eventbrite registration thing up um, because we need to know numbers. Yeah. It'll make a big difference to, to refreshments, but also to the setup. Because what I'd like to do, I'd like not to have rows of chairs. I'd like to have something like tables with chairs around them, yeah. with like a workbook awesome. for people to use and things like that. But the setup of the room will be 
quite dependent on the numbers of people coming. So if we have 30, 40 people coming, we can do that quite easily. If it's 150, it's, we might have to do a live feed through to the kitchen at the back or something. Uh, I'm not quite sure. But so we will do a registration. So can you, I, well, I'll, I'll send out the details of that this week. And can I ask you to register? Yeah. And then to ask your friends to register or register for them if they don't know how to do that. And, and bring, aim to bring, pray to bring, and this is the third thing is pray, at least one person each. Mm. Like, I think, and it's not, it's not like that's a mega goal or I'm not going to hold anybody accountable for it or we're not going to look down on anybody that's there without a friend. That's not the point. But just to say, could God do that? Could I have someone there? Could I have just one friend there? Maybe you can bring a whole bunch. That would be great. But at least that. So advertise it, bring a friend, um, and pray. I think those would be three great things to do. Um, anything else? Yes. Can you send an electronic thing in a way where it's big enough that it can be read? Because I sent it out to a couple of people and they're all coming soon. So. Ah, okay. I realized, Barry, thanks for telling me that because somebody else said that to me and I realized I'd sent the small version and there is a bigger <coughs> version. So I'm going to write that down now. Send large version. I will do that. Yes. You'll have to discuss that with me afterwards to tell me how to do that. <laughs> or somebody can to make sure that it's big enough. I don't know exactly how to do that for sure. So, I mean, I have an image. So we we'll experiment with it, shall we? We can experiment yeah. sending it round and okay. Very good. Good. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, right? If we can fix our eyes on Jesus, what a great year we'll have. Let's pray together. Father, uh, we thank you for what's written here in Hebrews. We thank you for the example of Jesus. We just thank you that we have many witnesses from the Bible times, but also from our own times. People have lived by faith. And we've had our own times in life where we've lived by faith and we've seen, we've seen you act. We pray, Father, to remember the, those times and to to be decisive about the obstacles in our way to fixing our eyes on Jesus and living that life of faith and help us to run the race with perseverance and, and, and to see clearly the joy that's available now and the joy that's available future, helping us in that way to, to live our life of faith, not, not just with just some kind of grim determination, but with a real joy in the same way that Jesus went to the cross. We thank you for that, and we pray, Father, that you would use our efforts with the teaching day to spread the gospel and make your kingdom attractive and make Jesus, um, help people to see Jesus as being as awesome as he truly is. We pray all this in his name. Amen. Amen. All right, one last song.